We will now hear the presentation of Distributel Communications Limited. Please introduce yourself and you may begin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. My name is Brad Fisher, and I'm the head of product and marketing for Distributel Communications Limited. Established in 1988, our company offers a full suite of competitive telecommunications and IP-based television services to Canadian residential and business customers. Joining me today are Jeff Batstone, Vice President, General Counsel, and Christopher Hickey, Director, Regulatory Affairs. In a manner that's consistent, with how we have structured our participation in this proceeding so far. My comments today will focus on three central points. One, that regulatory measures focused solely on promoting facilities-based competition have not resulted in sustainable competition or the degree of competitive options that should be available to Canadians. And that a new approach, albeit a familiar one, is required. Two, this new approach is to mandate the availability of the wholesale services that are required by full MVNOs to enter and compete in the retail wireless market. With those wholesale services subject to reasonable rates, terms and conditions that allow full MVNOs to compete while ensuring that national wireless carriers earn a fair return on their investments. And three, that there is a way you can accomplish this by making straightforward changes to the existing wholesale wireless roaming framework. Now, on to the first point. All measures uh, that have been taken to date to address the ongoing issues in the wireless market have focused exclusively on promoting facilities-based competition. Most recently, you concluded in 2015 that there were clear concerns with the state of competition in the retail market. You also found that, uh, you also found that wholesale MVNO services uh, satisfy that definition, the definition of an essential service, meaning that the availability of these services would allow greater competition in the retail wireless market. Nonetheless, a decision was reached to maintain a focus on facilities-based solutions by concluding that wholesale MVNO services should not be mandated at that time. Now, five years later, the market conditions that led to your findings and your concerns in 2015, they continue to exist today. For example, national, provincial, and territorial subscriber market shares are very much the same as they were then. The national wireless carriers continue to enjoy the vast majority of subscriber and revenue shares in the retail market. Barriers to entry remain very high, and wholesale, wholesale MVNO services remain unavailable. The state of competition in the retail market continues to be a cause for concern, with regulatory intervention being required to achieve the most basic of outcomes. The Commission should not, for example, have to impose a wireless code to ensure that wireless carriers treat their customers fairly. The Commission should not have to force wireless carriers to respond to customer demands, as was the case with data-only wireless plans. Canadians continue to express concerns about the prices they pay, the value that they receive, and the options that are available to them. These issues persist, even though we have leveraged every facilities-based tool available in the regulatory toolbox. We have tried complete forbearance. We have tried spectrum set-asides to enable entry by new facilities-based carriers. We have tried changing the Telecom Act to accommodate entry by one specific new facilities-based carrier. We have tried retail regulation through the imposition of codes and setting out requirements that specific service plans be provided. We have tried addressing the concerns of the facilities-based wireless carriers by mandating access to wholesale roaming. Yet, issues continue to exist. To our second point, these challenges are not unique to the retail wireless market. They are present in the broadband market. They were present in the local 
telephone market, and before that, the long distance market. Now, the only difference is that the issues in those retail markets were addressed by a different approach. One that targeted regulation at the wholesale level to allow greater competition at the retail level. It's time to take this approach in the wireless market and to mandate <coughs> availability of the wholesale services required by full MVNOs to allow them to enter the retail market and bring Canadians the benefits of greater wireless competition. By definition, a full MVNO is a service-based wireless provider that does not own spectrum or operate a radio access network. It instead relies on wholesale services purchased from an underlying wireless carrier to provide wireless services to customers in the retail market. Except for the operation of the radio access network, full MVNOs are responsible for all other aspects of their operations. They are responsible for sales, for marketing, distribution channels, customer service, retail pricing and plan creation, billing, SIM card management, customer activation and deactivation, their service platform, value-added services, and the operation of a core network. To use the existing wholesale wireline broadband framework as an analogy, Distributel, and other ISPs that use aggregated wholesale high-speed access services to provide their own retail broadband offerings. They're the wireline equivalent of a full MVNO. And in that context, we operate and are responsible for all aspects of our network, our operations, except those related to the very last mile of wireline access. Full MVNOs provide the greatest competitive benefits to the retail market as they are able to control all aspects of their operations, including their retail plan structures and pricing. For this reason, we believe the focus should be on mandating only the wholesale services that are required by full MVNOs to enter and compete in the retail market. Now on to our third point. Enabling full MVNOs to enter the retail market can be done in an efficient way by making modifications to the existing regulatory framework for wholesale wireless roaming services. First, remove the conditions that limit the use of wholesale roaming solely for the purpose of incidental roaming on national wireless carriers network. Second, require that mandated wholesale services be provided at the same quality level of service and using the same underlying technologies that the national wireless carriers use to provide their own retail services. Third, enable full MVNOs to control how their customers' data and voice traffic is routed and handled by requiring the national wireless carriers to hand back that traffic to the full MVNO. And these modifications and a decision that the existing wholesale wireless roaming rates would apply on an interim basis will allow that framework to be used to enable full MVNOs to enter the marketplace. Now, we recognize that subsequent work will be required to finalize wholesale MVNO framework, ensuring that applicable rates, terms and conditions are just and reasonable. However, this approach provides the benefits of allowing competitive entry during and while those matters are subject to the necessary process and determinations. And this concludes uh, our presentation and our views as to how we believe a more competitive wireless market can be achieved, one that will bring sustainable and substantial benefits to Canadians. Thank you for letting us appear today and we'd be happy to answer questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Commissioner Levy. Um, good afternoon. In your submission, um, you state that uh, absent regulatory intervention, uh, the Canadian wireless markets will not be sufficiently competitive. Um, so what impact on the competitiveness of the marketplace do you think regional carriers are having 
and what impact could they have in the future, assuming that they'll continue to upgrade and expand their networks. So I, I don't think there's any, sorry, uh, they've obviously had an impact. You know, we've seen, I think the most obvious example of that was the, the reaction to the big gig plans. Um, but I think if we look at the indicators, for instance, in the CMR, um, what we haven't seen is a big change in the market shares, uh, either on, you know, sort of customer and revenue side. And as a consequence, I mean, uh, you know, we look at that and conclude that they've not had the desired impact, at least to this point. Um, I mean, it's possible they may have more of an impact in the future, but frankly, it's been our submission in this proceeding and that uh, focusing entirely or relying entirely on a facilities-based approach um, is not going to deliver the kind and the, you know, the substance and degree of competition that um, we think uh, is necessary. Uh, so it, basically just that, um, you know, I'm sure they have had an effect. There's no question about that. But we believe that if we're to achieve a truly competitive market, one that's characterized by, you know, a, a, a broad range of options for, you know, a, across the spectrum, uh, we need to do something more than just rely on the existing facilities-based approach, whether it's through the, the incumbent, like the, the national wireless carriers or through regional carriers. In, in, further to um, your um, or, original interventions and the further comments, um, you say that the national carrier's decision to introduce the unlimited plan stems from decisions taken by Freedom Mobile. So um, you suggest that this uh, underscores the benefit of allowing uh, MVNOs to enter the market, but isn't this evidence that regional carriers are having positive competitive impacts? So we did agree with the Competition Bureau's findings uh, in that respect with that the, uh, when Freedom introduced the big gig plan, it did lead to a response from the national wireless carriers. That being said, in our view, you'd want to see more of these types of responses. We've seen one. We've seen big gig introduced by Unlimited. And the, we would have expected that if the market was operating properly competitively, then we would see this on an ongoing basis. We wouldn't be talking about a one flavor of products that now all are providing. And that is the impact of competition. You would want to see rollouts of new, innovative type of services, various forms of services that they're all responding to, and not just rolling out their own Me Too products to try to catch up uh, now that the horse is out of the barn when it came to that one service. Um, so that's our views as that. So yes, absolutely, it was a uh, big change in the market, but we'd want to see that continue on an ongoing basis as evidence uh, or the need for a truly competitive market. Uh, you also emphasize that, uh, and you did again um, today, that the national and provincial market shares of the existing carriers hasn't moved very much. Um, so what do you say in response to arguments that the better indicator of the competitive impact of regional carriers is found in the recent net additions made by those carriers? To be honest, I think the, uh, the data that we had available to us and that we looked at uh, related to market shares, revenue shares, uh, CRTC data, and that's what we uh, based our points on. Um, so I don't have a view uh, necessarily on the issue as it comes to net additions um, and that specific points. Just to add to that, I think, I, I don't think you can look only at new customers when you're assessing the competitiveness of, of the market, right? I think you have to look at, at overall market share you know, as one of the indicators of, of, of competition. But I, it, it feels to me like that would be too temporary a view, right? Just looking at net additions at a, at a particular point in time. Um, uh, it's got to be a holistic view of, of the entire market. And, you know, we, the Competition Bureau has looked at it in detail, done extensive studies, and concluded that these markets, you know, there was a, a slight improvement with the introduction of the regional carriers. But overall, these markets are still uh, characterized by, you know, joint dominance and, and significant market power. So uh, it's one thing to look at, but we don't think it tells the entire story. 
So if the Commission were to mandate uh, wholesale MVNO access, what impact do you expect them to have on the Canadian marketplace and in what kind of time frame? So uh, I think, uh, you know, you heard from two cows uh, yesterday and I thought that he had a lot of good things to say from a very personal perspective, having been involved in it in the United States. You know, if if you were to mandate MVNO access, I think what you're doing is you're opening up the club. You know, right now there is a club of wireless providers in Canada. We would put the regional providers in the club, right? They are, they're integrated with other operations. They've been around forever. I think all of them trace their roots back to some form of monopoly or, you know, something like that. If you open up the market to, to service-based providers, what you're doing is you are opening up that universe of people that may come forward with something interesting and helpful. Um, until you do that, if you, if you insist on facilities-based as the only form of competition, you're going to be stuck with the providers that you have. So I, to me, the principal benefit of, of MVNO is that you will lower that barrier to entry and you'll allow people in that, that have not been in to this point and who will come at competition in wireless from a very different perspective. Just to build on Jeff's comments, the widening of, of the field really uh, creates an environment for the sustainability of that competition and um, ensures you know, we don't end up in a new market share stasis um, with uh, regional providers. Uh, to Jeff's point, who you know also uh, are operating dominant uh, businesses in uh, other product lines. So the concept of um, uh, of opening for full MDNO as a service service based competition uh, really ensures in the long run that we have uh, continued co competition. We have uh, innovation and an ability to serve the segments of the market that may not be served today by the largest um, and large providers. And then, sorry, just to your points about how quick part of our proposal as to let's use the existing frameworks is because that allows us to not have to reinvent regulatory wheels. We have the framework in place. There are concerns, I think, that you've heard otherwise with the rate that's in place. But if you make that rate interim and you remove a couple conditions that we identified, very quickly, as a result of that decision, would uh, full and venal entry be enabled um, following that decision? Should the Commission mandate wholesale MVNO access on all national MNOs or on a subset of them? Uh, we believe that all national wireless carriers should be mandated to provide wholesale MVNO services. What about the regional carriers? Uh, we have not put forward a uh, proposal that the regional wireless carriers be required. Uh, in fact, we, uh, under our proposal, they would be able to make use of wholesale MVNO services if they so chose, um, the same way that a full MVNO service provider would as well. But we have not proposed an obligation that they be provided or mandated to provide uh, wholesale MVNO services. And that would include SaskTel? That would include SaskTel. Um, in your um, intervention in May, you submitted that the measures taken to date to address lack of competition in the retail wireless market um, through that narrow lens of fa uh, facilities only competition have not succeeded. Um, in your views, what would we need to see happen in that market to deem it sufficiently competitive? I think we'd want to start seeing actual changes in uh, trailing indicators when it comes to market shares. The, those have been remarkably consistent. The 90% uh, since 2012, we want to see um, continued falling prices. We do recognize that that's the uh, Commission's own data shows that there's been certain falling prices, but you'd want to see that on an ongoing basis. But you'd also want to see different types of plans and services offered. Uh, right now, we have basically bucket of voice, bucket of data, and they all look very similar. We filed other data uh, and other evidence that showed if you take all the plans and put them next to each other, they're remarkably similar. So you'd want to start seeing differentiation in the type of plans and the services. And you'd also want to see people targeting specific areas and communities. You'd want to see a market where parties go after um, certain segments or niches of the market. And it's not just broad-based and offering the same services to uh, the uh, the market as a whole. And if you start seeing success in those types of metrics, uh, those I think start laying the fundamentals that uh, there's greater uh, competition in the market. Uh, 
Um, have you ever approached uh, MNOs in order to negotiate any kind of an agreement, uh, access or other arrangement to provide mobile wireless services? Yes, we have. Um, Distributel has approached very, like, I, I think it's fair to say probably all the M MNOs um, over a fairly long period of time. I'm aware, long before my time at Distributel, but I'm aware of discussions back to the sort of mid to late 2000s um, and more recent discussions, uh, you know, within the last, I would say, six months probably. And what's the uh, outcome been? Uh, the same every time. Um, the door gets closed very quickly. Um, again, I, I don't have personal experience of a lot of this, but I've talked to a lot of people, you know, I've talked to people in the company who have, and um, the experience is that we, we raise it, and it, there's, no, there's no bite, like there's, there's no real interest in negotiating. There has not been a substantive negotiation between Distributel and any national wireless carrier about MVNO. And, and that includes that, uh, you know, the flavor of MVNO, you know, we have a certain conception of what we would like to do as an MVNO, but I don't believe that the discussions have even got to that point um, as to what they would be willing to, to, you know, consider and negotiate on. So, so what's, what's the barrier? Like where do you hit the wall? The barrier is there's nothing in it for them at this point in time. Right. Now, but, why is that? Because uh, obviously you would be paying uh, a wholesale rate, so they're getting something for that. You're taking over um, perhaps a segment of the market that hasn't been reached, that's a, that's, a, that's a niche. You might be using capacity that isn't otherwise used. Um, you take over the costs of billing and customer relations and all of those sorts of things. So why is that not um, sufficiently tantalizing enough to bring someone on board? I think this is another indicator of the lack of competition in the market. I think if we had a truly rivalrous, rivalrous competitive market, you know, somebody who had excess capacity would be out there trying to sell it to a wholesaler so that they could, you know, use that as an additional channel to, to use, to utilize their network and to, you know, to get more subscribers effectively on their network. Um, the fact that that doesn't happen suggests to me that they don't feel there's a need um, to compete in that way, right? It, it, it's just, um, they all view it. I, I think the, the, the national wireless carriers have been used to running things by themselves this entire time. They're just not interested in having any more competitors in, in the market. Um, if you obviously got some plan, I'm sorry, you, do you want to add something? Thank you. I did want to build on, on Jeff's comment um, just to um, close out in that most recent discussions uh, in, this, in this subject uh, have been met with, uh, in general, uh, kind of a wait and see approach. Well, let's, let's see what happens, you know, because there's some hearings coming, so maybe we'll just, we'll just see how that goes. Um, and it's, to me, uh, personally, it's a stark contrast to um, the experience I had uh, operating an MVNO uh, in the United States. And so where I had facilities-based carriers uh, approaching and vying for my business, to your point, uh, because there is profit to be had, um, and there is the offloading of cost and expense and hassle in certain parts of the market where a national facilities-based provider uh, isn't interested um, or isn't scaled to operate in. So uh, just to build on it, close there. And um, I'm, I'm interested in your um, comment about those being in places that you, uh, would otherwise not be attractive. Would some of those places be remote and rural parts of the country? Uh, in the United States, it was probably the most remote territory yeah, of uh, the 50 states. So um, can you share some of your consideration with us vis-a-vis um, -vis your plans to, to get into the market? Uh, for example, um, would you consider entering as a full MVNO and sort of what geographic markets were you contemplating entering? 
So absolutely, uh, to the question on the full and VNO, that would be our uh, that would be our plan. The, there's loads of benefits as it comes to a full and VNO. We would want to be able to control the end-to-end -end experience, like we do when we offer broadband services today using wholesale services. We're responsible for the full. A to Z when it comes to operations, except for the operation of the last mile in the broadband, uh, broadband network, which allows us to bring uh, the greatest value and service to our customers. So absolutely, we'd be looking for a full MVNO. Um, and some ideas on product there, but from a geographic market, the, we are currently a ISP and a telecom service provider uh, currently across the country, though we are focused in Ontario, uh, Quebec, um, out west as well, not as much out east, but we'd be looking to do that in the places where we're able to provide value uh, on a, as an ISP as well, because we see those as very unified type of service offerings. So you want bundle services? Yeah. Yes. Brad can speak to the bundling, but when we do offer those services, that is definitely a high value that we see if we're able to offer that quad, that other piece that's currently missing from our service portfolio. I would say that um, you know the starting point for us is uh, a geographic mapping to parts of the country that we have established a brand presence um, in uh, to date. This seems a logical. Um, augmentation to a double play, triple play, uh, household purchase. Uh, but beyond that, um, I, I think we look at the market not just from a geographic perspective as a sort of starting point. We look at um, market segmentation and we look to understand where there are uh, unserved or underserved um, niches in terms of market segmentation within those geographies. Um, and so that's where, you know, I think this concept of um, uh, more providers with more choice for consumers starts to play in. Um, we'll be looking at markets that aren't getting necessarily the attention um, or the focus that national uh, providers are, uh, are focusing on today. Would an MVNO have the ability to serve customers looking for um, low cost and occasional use plans? I mean, I think that the answer to that question depends a bit on the rates, right? Um, so provided that we have a, a, um, a wholesale rate that's just and reasonable that reflects the costs, um, we sh I would think we'd be, we should be able to build a plan for local, you know. And that would be the primary incentive? That would give you the incentive? I, it's a necessary part of the equation, right? Um, for any plan that we offer, you know, we've got to have a wholesale rate that, that works. Um, it's the same on the broadband side. It's, it's the same any, in any case like this. Now, we, you know, to be competitive, we would have to be lean in terms, and just as we are on the broadband side, in terms of what our costs on top of that that rate, because that becomes the largest component of it. But, um, but certainly, I mean, it, it's possible to build those kind of plans. Uh, provided that the, that rate is, is there. And I think especially when it comes to occasional use, the one thing that's missing or has been effectively removed from the current market is actual prepaid services. So there was a time, and I remember it vividly, you'd go to the store, you'd buy a card, you'd buy 100 minutes, and those 100 minutes would continue on until you use them. They might expire in six months or a year. Now you're seeing that's been transformed to prepaid on a monthly basis, where you pay $5 a month for this, and if you don't, you lose it. And so when you're talking occasional use, I mean, there is an issue with the rates, but you would be able to bring in occasional use if someone wanted to bring back prepaid as we understood it before. There is a absolute market there from what we understand from the consumer groups that are concerned about its absence and a way that you could do that um, the, uh, in a way to bring back occasional use services, certainly. And, and that goes back to that question of um, the providers that are currently in the market. I don't believe that you would see a situation where something like prepaid gets pulled by everybody in a truly competitive market, right? Like I, you know, there should be somebody that still wants to serve those customers. Um, and I th so I think, again, if you allow MBNO competition, competition by service-based providers, I think there's a much higher likelihood you're going to get somebody who's willing to offer a product like that. You know, it's an additional option for the customers. Um, I lived in a, in a country where you know, probably about 90% of the mobile services were sold on a prepaid basis. Like, the, the, you know, there are people that need that. Um, 
the fact that it's not being offered today, I think, is it, again is a reflection, like, uh, of the sort of I hate to say coordinated, but if you look in our second submission, you know, the when you look at those flanker brands and the packages are are essentially identical. You know, there's one option really. You can get it from three different companies, but there's one option, right? The the MVNOs, the quote unquote MVNOs that are in the market today, it's the same thing. Like it's essentially the same service. Um, I think until you we go beyond this, the existing facilities-based providers, I don't think we're going to see the the true diversity of offerings um, that I assume we should get if, if that market's opened up to to uh, MVNO providers. Um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, Competition Bureau's uh, model. Um, in their submission, the Bureau suggests that uh, several regional facilities-based carriers would likely be in a good position to take advantage of their proposed facilities-based MVNO access model. Um, would you consider offering a retail-based MVNO service if you qualified for mandated wholesale MVNO access? under the Competition Bureau's model. So uh, I guess uh, under the Competition uh, Bureau's model, to my understanding, the uh, was that if you are a regional facilities-based wireless carrier, you would have access to their MVNO services. So I just want to understands, uh, so I'm not sure I'm quite understanding the question, as we aren't currently one today, um, and how we would be able to access some Vino services under that. So I just uh, think I'm misunderstanding the question. Well, let's just skip ahead to the, the, the notion that these sorts of things would be time limited. Um, do you, what do you think of the, the notion that a sunset clause would be implemented, and would five years be enough? So I think in anything, when you undertake any type of regulation, it could be the Competition Bureau's model, it could be mandated wholesale and vino services, but in general, when you put a sunset clause on something, you effectively say, this is the point things will all end. And then you hope that you put in the correct market conditions that by that time you can actually pull the rug out from under the regulation. Realistically, the way that we look at it is when regulatory intervention is needed, those regulations and intervention needs to happen until the reasons that you decided to regulate in the first place no longer exist. And so to say that'll happen in five years, or say that'll happen in three years, or seven years, it's really hard to peg when those regulations will have had their full effect, we've solved the market issues, and now we can take those, uh, take those regulations out of the market. So we are a little bit uh, concerned that you're able to accurately say five years, and then those measures will have done everything they need to do. And I, sorry, if I could just add to that, I, I, just generally on the Competition Bureau study, I mean, you know, I think we were, we felt there was a lot of really good information in there. We felt that their conclusions on the state of the market were, were bang on. Um, somebody else said it, I'm not sure who, uh, but we don't agree with the recommendation, right? Uh, it, and I think, to me, that five-year recommendation was a similar sort of academic line of thinking that probably isn't practical in reality, right? I think I, I would completely agree with, with what Chris has said, that you, know, you need to regulate until it's no longer necessary to regulate, right? And so once the market's competitive, yeah, you step out at that point. You're not needed. Until then, you are. Um, if it's five years, great. If it's more than that, so be it. It'll have to be. Um, but you know, to say that there's a particular period in time that's going to work, I think, is just uh, you know a level of crystal ball gazing that none of us are truly capable of. Well, of course, you're looking at um, a full-scale MVNO model that doesn't anticipate necessarily um, a fac the facilities-based model that the that they were um, trying to encourage, and therefore uh, the notion of having. Uh, deadlines that relate to build-outs and, and so forth uh, are, um, are really not, um, uh, you know, germane to your particular proposal. Do you have, um, do you have, do you own any Spectrum at this point? We do not. Do you have plans to acquire any? Well, I think the fact is that, I mean, Distributel, we're proud of our size, the, but as you've heard yesterday, Kojiko uh, finds it 
uh, barrier to be able to purchase Spectrum, and we are unfortunately smaller than Kojiko. And so when we look at Spectrum, it is a substantial barrier to entry. Um, we're talking uh, billions of dollars in cost to be able to obtain, uh, and so it hasn't been uh, our ability uh, to date to uh, be able to obtain Spectrum, and it is, but it's not, I will be clear that it's not simply, it's not that we don't have interest, it's that it's not something that's just very simple to come by for a company of our scale. And again, I, I think, you know, I'm going back to things I've said already, but um, we don't think that's the right approach going forward, right? Like, to, 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 to try to believe that a company like Distributel could acquire the necessary spectrum and build out the necessary network to compete on a facilities-based basis with the existing providers, honestly, I just don't think is realistic. Um, that's, and I mean, the fact that we have three national network operators in Canada and only two networks, I think tells you everything you need to know about the difficulty of building out a national wireless network in Canada, right? Um, it, it's just not really realistic to think that you're going to get multiple networks. And so in, those circ in that set of circumstances, I think it's important to switch gears and think about how best to promote competition. And for us, that's the service-based model. So to speak about trying to acquire Spectrum, this sort of thing, to us, it's, it's it's just not the approach that we think is the, the best way forward. So let's talk about what would be the best way forward. And of course, the, the first um, issue that arises is eligibility. Um, could you describe what eligibility criteria you believe would be achievable and relevant to full MVNOs? So our first out of the door proposal, our out of the door position and first position in this proceeding was that uh, eligibility, uh, eligibility criteria, apologies, the, uh, isn't necessarily required. That we shouldn't be trying to put um, gates uh, and rails on who can participate in the markets and enter the markets. As the proceeding participated, uh, as the proceeding continued, the, there was a lot of discussion about eligibility criteria and a lot of it came from Kojiko's HMNO proposal and saying that uh, let's make eligibility criteria that would basically require facilities-based investment in broadband facilities as the barrier to entry to uh, have access to MVNO. When we looked at that, we didn't think that was very feasible, so we did put forward an alternative approach that if you're looking to create uh, uh, eligibility criteria, that would be at least relevant and achievable. And that was for us the SELEC model, uh, effectively saying that where you want to operate as a full MVNO, you must also operate as a CLEC. And we did that because it's achievable. There are barriers to entry to become a CLEC, but they are nowhere near uh, building your own broadband-based facilities uh, network. Uh, and they're at least relevant. When you're a CLEC, you have inner exchange with other carriers, uh, you have a network, your use, uh, you have your systems in place for LNP, uh, local number portability, you have access to numbering resources, and there's things that there that would translate over to the operation of a full MVNO. And so we said, if you are looking and concerned about eligibility criteria, here's something you could do that does require a demonstration of commitments, does require a heightened barrier of entry, but one that's achievable and is at least relevant to the operation of a full NVNO. So that is why we put forward that alternative proposal uh, in our intervention uh, and continued throughout the proceeding. Just to be 100% consistent, I mean, you know, LEC status is a facilities-based category, right? Like, and so we're not suggesting it at, from that perspective. We're not saying you need to be facilities-based to be an MVNO. Um, what we are saying is that that was, a, of the the sort of um, categories or, or classifications that are already out there in the, the CRTC realm, CLEC seemed like the, the most appropriate one to use. Um, maybe we call it something different in the context of MVNO, but um, it would be, uh, 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 sorry, I'm just trying to make that distinction that it's not, we're not suggesting by tying it to CLEC status that it's tied to facility somehow. Okay. Uh, that that um, kind of barrier might um, forestall the, the question that I have next, and that is uh, uh, some parties have raised concerns that uh, if uh, the entry is wide open, that um, well-capitalized uh, companies, um, MVNOs, in, in North America, you know, like the large North American tech firms could... Uh, could move in. Do you think that, uh, that that's a valid concern? 
or does the or does your notion of a clique kind of um, structure forestall that? Oh, so with the uh, ownership rules that are in place today, the CLEC rules wouldn't wholly forestall that um, the, with the foreign ownership there. Um, but it would require further commitments and entry and barrier into the markets, and we haven't seen that happen today. Um, and I understand wireless might be different from VoIP or might be different than that, but the, uh, we haven't seen that type of threat from um, some of the large multinationals to come into our market today. So we understand that concern. I'm not 100% I agree that the, uh, we should construct our whole framework to ensure that doesn't happen on the possible threat that, that may occur when they've shown no interest in doing so today. I haven't seen Google uh, participate in this proceeding. I haven't seen some of those that have presented before you and said that we certainly want to get in the markets. Here in Distributel, who's been in the market for 30 years, we certainly want to continue offering Canadians uh, service and hope to do that by wireless, but we haven't seen those come up and say, please, let's uh, get a Invino framework so we can do the same. And if we're being consistent, and I think we need to be, um, I don't think we can say you should exclude some people and allow others, right? Like uh, our approach certainly was, you know, if you want to achieve the, the goal of a truly competitive market, you need to open it up. So, uh, you know, we have not said, we've not put forward a suggestion or a, a proposal like the ITPA or some of the others that have focused on this issue um, to say that, no, this should be a Canadian only sort of thing. Um, maybe we'll regret that because uh, we're not resourced like Google or Amazon, but, um, but that, you know, we didn't feel that we would be being consistent in our message if, if we took that approach. With respect to rates, terms, and conditions, and so forth, you propose that the Commission could modify the wholesale roaming tariff as a starting point for wholesale and the access. Um, can you explain how we should modify it? to set a final wholesale MDNO rate? Well, when it comes to the rate specifically, that would have to follow after a revisit and a process based uh, to establish final cost based on phase two cost based uh, costing. So that would require uh, a new process to be initiated, a costing proceeding to be undertaken, and with the outcome of that proceeding, a new final rate uh, that's based on phase two costs uh, plus a markup, uh, as we have in the uh, other regulated wholesale services. So that would be the end goal. Uh, part of the reason that we've taken that approach is it, would, uh, it provides a starting rate. It provides the existing uh, wholesale wireless roaming rates that could be used on an interim basis. So we don't have to start to make a rate from the ground up. We can say we have a rates, we can use this on the interim while we review the rates and determine what the rate should be final, but let's not wait until we go through all of that process to allow entry into the markets. We have a rate that can be used now, let's allow entry to the market while we do all those things that will be required to finalize, those, uh, finalize the rates uh, and the framework. Just building on that in terms of timeliness to market, um, you know, unlike some of the other uh, products that that have uh, you know, come before um, regulation, we have today a well-defined um, framework for interconnecting to uh, the the roaming arrangements, and so uh, this isn't something uh, to, to Chris's point that requires a lot of development. It's not requiring new technologies. Uh, this is something that um, an MVNO, a full MVNO, who aspires to be in the market. Um, could leverage existing uh, interconnections, existing um, ecosystem uh, to plug in and, and begin uh, a retail offering. You have uh, suggested uh, that under the policy directions, the Commission should consider all types of competition and investment, and you've been very consistent today in, in your openness. Uh, what types, what specific types of investment um, beyond facilities could count towards uh, investment targets for MVNOs? I just need to find a list of the, uh, the list that I have, but I think it's on the, so we provided kind of a list of all things that a full MVNO would have to do to enter the market. And if I flip through the notes, I could find that list, but it is substantive. It's not, you know, we won't be able to just use what we have today 
and say, wow, we can be at MVNO now. So we're gonna have to make investments in equipment, make investments in operations, we're gonna have to make uh, in the uh, core network equipment and kind of throughout that allows you to build an MVNO. And those are substantial costs. With respect to a ongoing, that's a little bit more the uh, that's a little bit more hard to make a specific uh, threshold of investment that would be required. We invest every day on an ongoing basis in our uh, on an ongoing basis in our business, but uh, I can't speak to specific thresholds at the moment. So I. Distributel is about, I think we're slightly under 400 employees today, right? So if we're adding wireless to that, there's going to be employees that we'll need. Um, uh, there will be, and this is where I get completely out of my depth as, as, a, as a lawyer, um, but, you know, there are technical aspects to this, right? Like, we are characterized as, you know, well... I think I saw us in a footnote once referred to as bottom feeders. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the characterization is always that we are somehow stealing the networks that we use, right? Which I think is very much not the case. You know, we, we pay for the networks that we use um, through the, uh, the, the rates. Um, but then on top of that, there, are, there is equipment we have to buy. You know, we purchase a lot of services from um, the the provi other providers in order to sort of connect up, do the inter interconnections, these sorts of things. I, we would have to do, the only thing we're not doing in this model is the radio access network. So everything else, we're going to have to have the signaling links, we're gonna have to have the connections to the roaming clearinghouse, we're gonna have to have the GSM membership, we're gonna have to have all those things. Um, and uh, that involves a significant investment in, in time, employees, um, equally equipment. You know, it, obviously it's not on the same order of magnitude as, you know, building out a, a radio network, but it, nor is it trivial either, or, or everybody would be doing it. Uh, if that list was uh, part of uh, your earlier submissions, it's part of the record. If it wasn't, or if there are amendments to it, um, we can um, take it as, a, as an undertaking and you can file before March the 10th. Absolutely. It, it was part of our first intervention. Okay. The, uh, so I, I checked it is in there. I just couldn't get to it fast enough, but, uh, right. but it is in our first intervention. That's fine. Um, are you familiar with ISED's conditions of license? Yes. Um, do you think that would be an administratively efficient way to track investment? I think Chris is now regretting saying yes a minute ago. <laughs> I'm not familiar, familiar enough with those conditions to know. Um, I don't know if you are, Chris. But. Yeah, I, I, I will take that back. I was thinking that uh, the license conditions applicable, to, um, but not in a tracking mechanism. So I apologize. I will take no, yes if, back. If you want to think about it and, and uh, file a comment, that, would, that would be fine. I just have a, um, a couple of, of uh, brief questions, and then I'm done. Um, if the commission does mandate wholesale MVNO access, which carriers should be obligated to provide that access? Uh, we're in the view that uh, the national wireless carriers should be mandated to provide uh, wholesale MVNO services, and we do not believe that the regional carriers should be required to do so. But we do not object to them also having access to those mandated wholesale MVNO services. So do you think that that requirement to provide MVNO access should um, only apply to the wireless carrier in each area that has the largest network coverage or market share? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, we would say all three. Uh, the, the fact is that there is three, uh, well, three large national wireless carriers, there's two networks. Um, and the, we see on all market share and market subscriber, market power being held by each individual of those three. And so our view would be that um, each would be mandated to provide a national um, wholesale, sorry, each would be uh, mandated to provide a wholesale MVNO service, and we wouldn't divvy it up by you're required here and you're required there. Each would be required to provide where they operate. I mean, and, we would, um, we'd, sorry, only, sorry. we'd only be on one of those networks, uh, but I think it's important to have 
the option of going to any one of the, the three to try to, you know, and we haven't talked about negotiation specifically, but, you know, to the extent anything needs to be negotiated, then it's obviously better to have three potential parties to negotiate with as opposed to one, for instance. Uh, so I would suggest that it's, you know, the mandate should be there in respect of all, all three. But of course, it then opens it up that perhaps another MVNO could make a deal with another of the carriers, and then you'd have competition at your level too. <laughs> We're used to that, right? <laughs> On the wireline side, there are all manner of competitors for, for uh, broadband uh, internet services. Um, we fully expect that we're going to have, well, let's face it, we're going to be competing against the incumbent operators, right? There's, it doesn't get harder than that. Um, so yeah, we're, we'd be, we're completely open to that idea. And, and finally, um, I just want to end with uh, the, the role of the flanker brands. You've, you've mentioned it before. You say that there really isn't that much differentiation in the, in the markets. Um, so you, it, would, it would appear that you're quite confident that MVNOs can offer more competitive services than the current flanker brands do. I think that's absolutely the case. I mean, those flanker brands look more to me like a hedge against the regional providers than anything else, right? They, they, they rolled out those quote unquote alternatives, um, you know, when they were faced with, with competition from the regional providers. But the fact that they all rolled them out exactly the same says something, right? Like they're not, they didn't feel it was necessary to actually come up with their own compelling um, offer to the market, right? Um, so it, it, we, the flanker brands, I think, are, sorry, I lost the thread of the question, to be honest. Um, could you just repeat it for me? Just uh, what what uh, what do you think makes uh, MVNOs what could be more competitive than the flanker brands? Oh yeah, exactly. So sorry, I, I think again the the presentation from Two Cows yesterday I thought was really interesting. Right, the the competition isn't always going to be on rates and minutes and and data. I mean that's very important, but there's going to be limitations to what you can do in that space. I mean, it could be that the competition is on something entirely else, like you know, some some other attribute. Like I think always of Amazon in this. Um, think of the first time that you ordered something with one click on Amazon. That was an innovation that they brought to online retailing, right? But it's not it's not the actual sort of thing, right? Like it, it, it was how you did the thing. And I think you know you could. I think, as the gentleman from Two Cows was saying, you know, if you open this up, you're going to get a whole bunch of ideas that you've never even considered or thought of will come to the fore if there's enough people participating in that market and trying to come up with innovative new ways to, to sell to, to customers. So, And I, I think as well, I think today there was a concern expressed by a company that they had too many service offerings, that they did something because it was hard to juggle the hundreds or, you know, hundreds of service offerings that they had in market. Well, we're not quite sure hundreds of service offerings, if customers are seeing value in each and are able to choose from the ones that they think most, uh, most benefit them are a bad thing. And understand why one company probably doesn't benefit from offering hundreds of service plans itself. But if you have competitors that come in and they offer different flavors and different types of services and different packages, and a, cu a customer can look and say, yep, that one suits my needs best, that's the type of different offers and value that bringing in more, com uh, more competitors into a market can, uh, can capture. And, and I would just add with respect to the flanker uh, offerings, the flanker brand offerings today, they're very homogenous. Um, they're still very broadly targeted. Uh, to the marketplace. And what you're not seeing is the specialization. You're not seeing uh, specific segments of the market that, again, may be underserved or unserved um, with uh, packages tailored uh, directly for them, right? What, and when do, we, what do you, what, can you give me an example? I'll give me a great example. Um, uh, there's a, uh, I was a company out of uh, San Diego that specialized in uh, wireless and VNO uh, services for the uh, the seniors uh, market, um, and you know everything from a, a product uh, selected um, for you know larger buttons, uh, bigger screens, um, ease of use, to packages that were tailored you know specifically for the senior market, uh, and the way that they were priced, the way they were delivered uh, to the marketplace. 
Uh, again, just as an example, uh, as, as a demographic and as a, a market segment, that a specialized MBNO um, was able to open up and leverage and bring something uh, to the customers uh, that they couldn't find from the national uh, providers nor from the very broadly based flanker brands. Um, and my last question is, what kind of percentage of the market could you see MVNOs taking over? I hope a lot. The uh, it's hard. The uh, you know we've seen uh, you know eight percent to ten percent on our wholesale ISP side where competitors have been able to come in and take uh, that level of market share. We think there's lots of room to move. Uh, I don't see us. Uh, I don't see us cracking 50%, but I would hope somewhere in the 10, uh, maybe up to the, you know, uh, the 10% range most likely, maybe up to the 20% range and higher if things were successful, but I think the 10% range is uh, probably where it will go and then uh, increase from there. And I think it's important to keep that in context, right? Like the Every time we have one of these hearings, you guys get a very doom and gloom scenario from the incumbent providers, right? Like, yeah, the suggestion is that somehow by mandating MVNO, well, sorry, 5,000 people just lost their jobs at TELUS, right? Um, it, you know, it's it, the wireline experience um, has shown that, you know, they, they're, it, it doesn't prevent them from investing. It doesn't have the kind of, We'd like it to have a fundamental change on the market, in the market, right? We, we would like to take a very significant market share. But I think looking at it uh, probably internationally as well, although we haven't done any particular study on that, MVNOs are not, they don't take over a majority of the market or anything like that. Uh, but they do play a very important competitive role in disciplining the, the providers that are in the market and providing additional options to, to uh, customers that, that weren't there otherwise. Thank you very much for your uh, answers to my questions. I'm, uh, I c I'll conclude now. Thank you. Just a couple of short questions from me to follow on. Um, you talked a lot at the outset of your uh, responses about market share and that being um, strong evidence of insufficient competition. Uh, and you just now briefly talked about what kind of potential market share gains you could get. Can I ask you, in your view, what market share do they have to lose before the market's competitive? You said before you don't un remove the underlying conditions. You don't remove the solution, the regulatory intervention, until the underlying problem is resolved. Presumably the underlying problem is you want to say the market is now competitive. What's the number, in your view? There's different ways that I could think of tackling that, uh, but I think if I'm able to take, a, take an undertaking on that to give an actual proper answer, because I, like, I think we have, we want it to not be 90%, 90%, 90%, 30%, 30%, 30%, 30%. We would want it not to be uniform, but I think if it's the question of is it 10%, is it 15%, is it 20%, the fact is that if it got 20% and you still had, well, if you got to a percent and the underlying concerns that are there, then I don't think it's just an issue of is removing market share sufficient to prove that the market is fully competitive. I just it, raised that because you had focused on market share as the indicator at yeah. the beginning. So if you would like to do it by undertaking, that's fine. I just wanted to have a sense of um, what was your answer to when will we know the market is indeed competitive? If, uh, if I could, sorry, go ahead. Oh. Um, if I could just add, like, I, I think even the Bureau would say that the market share is not the whole picture, right? I, I think they specifically say that. You can't just look at the market share to determine if, if the market's competitive. So I, I think, unfortunately, it's, it's, and I don't know, we said 10%, but who knows what we might get to. Like, like, I think market shares are, you know, it's very difficult to predict, and I think it's difficult to predict what level of market share means that the market's competitive, right? It's going to depend on how many are in the market. It's going to depend on what types of offers. We had this discussion earlier today about um, duopoly, right? I mean, I think it is probably possible that you can have two providers in a market and have a, a competitive market. 
we personally feel that we have three providers in the market today, or four in some cases, and um, it's not competitive because the, the, the level of competitive intensity is not there, right? So I, I think, unfortunately, it's got to be that assessment of all of the, the, the competitive factors in the market. That's fine. Thank you. One last question. He also pointed out that um, you've proposed using um, the existing roaming rate as a starting point. Um, but you made the point that whatever the wholesale rate is, it needs to be sufficient um, so that you have uh, a sufficient margin, profit margin to operate. Uh, kind of a maybe a tautological question. What happens as prices go down? Presumably, your presence in the market uh, and the rationale for mandating MVNOs is to push prices down. As prices go down, presumably that puts pressure on your margin. What happens then? It, it does. Um, I think uh, if the reason our prices are going down is because costs are going down, then hopefully that wholesale rate would be decreasing as well, right, to well, reflect presumably that. Presumably prices are going down because competitive intensity has been increased by your entry into the marketplace. And that's where we need to be more efficient than our competitors so that the remaining cost above you know, the, the wholesale inputs is uh, not so high that there's no margin left, right? Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your submission and your responses.